Kim Gordon is here. How are, can you hear me? Hi. Hi. Can, can you hear me? I can. How are you? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? Okay. Well, let's see if we can, we'll definitely, look, I'll say this. By the time this is done, you'll definitely know how you're doing. It might not be good, but you'll have, you'll definitely have an idea of how you're doing. And it's just the news today was such idiocracy that, um, like the news is depressing every day, but today was just confounding. Yeah. It's every day is hard. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a, uh, a challenge to just keep your head up and it keep is. going, keep going forward. Yes. As an American. <laughs> Now you've been pretty engaged this year though in terms of you were doing a lot of a lot of canvassing, right? Is that what you call it? Um I was doing some god that seems so long ago now. Um, right? That was pre that was way back uh at the beginning of the year. Right, yeah. Um Yes, that was that was actually um, you know, I learned that by kind of joining in, you can really um, turn your anger into, you know, something, uh, a moment when you're not thinking about it because you're, you know, talking to people. And it, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> but uh, after Bernie um, dropped out, I didn't really do any more canvas. Good, yeah, that would, uh, it was, a, it, I think, got a little less uh, inspirational. Indeed. Yeah. But I'll say this. You know what is, uh, watch the segue on this. You know what is inspirational? See, that's how you do it. Is you and your, you've had an incredibly productive 12 months, which is inspirational. You have an amazing new book out, and you had an album come out at the end of last year, which... uh I got to say, you really, uh, this is a good, this is a good, a creative period for you. Yeah. I mean, generally every day, I just don't feel like I'm doing anything, but I guess I somehow get things done. But the, yeah, the record was, um, uh, I had so much anxiety about going on tour, just putting a band together, things I'd never done, playing with people I hadn't played with. Mm -hmm. Um, having to memorize lots of lyrics after playing improv for 10 years. <laughs> um, sure. And you know, we got to do three dates. Um, and uh, yeah. And then, um, I mean, I'm glad we got to do something. Um, yeah. We came, I came back from Paris the middle of March and um, I've and then, been here ever since. Yeah. Um, and then it all yeah, got shut I, down. The Brazil book somehow got finished. So you were going to um, do, so you did a couple, a few dates for, for, uh, no home record, which was the album you put out last year, which is right, a right. great record. And you were, you pulled the plug on a whole bunch of stuff that was going to be the rest of your year. Yeah. Well, we were going to go on tour, you know, in Europe and the States. And then actually I was also going to do this, um, um, do a few dates with this Warhol film with Bill Nace and um, Steve Gunn, John Tuzinski that we had um, kind of came together as a live improv soundtrack when I had a show at the Warhol Museum last year. Mm -hmm. um, but we were supposed to play the Big Ears Festival and a few other places. Um, I mean, that's something that can just always happen. Um mm -hmm. Yeah. If those, if those venues still exist. <laughs> yeah, I was, it's funny. I was just thinking about wondering what, like the Warhol Museum, that's like a five story place. It's one of the, one of my favorite places. And I was just like, man, I hope that is going to be on the other side of all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I think they'll probably, um, I'm sure that Warhol Foundation will. I don't know. Yeah. There, there's other separate entities, but I'm sure that um, they'll 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 have lots of um, 
donors. Yeah, and they can always sell a soap box, which would exactly. kind of cover the cover a year's worth of rent. Um, the storage yeah, boxes with detritus in it that was mm-hmm. a daily activity, putting it yeah. in a box and dating it. Now you you have this book out that came out a month or so ago, a couple months ago, No Icon. Yeah. And this is, uh, to me at least, and you to correct me if I'm wrong, this, this, it works as a really nice kind of companion to your memoir, which came out about five years ago. Where right. one is, one is you're telling the story and the other one is you're showing your story and you're yeah, showing Yeah, kind your of a visual, um, yeah, I guess memoir, scrapbook. Um, I mean, it's not something I would have, thought of doing <laughs> um they approached me and um they uh this editor was like um oh yeah we were you know wanted to do a they'd done a book of with chloe savigny and they wanted to do one with us mm-hmm. and this icon and i was like um that disturbs me <laughs> <laughs> the, the branding of feminism is kind of it's funny um Anyway, so um, that's why the title is just no icon. But um, but you know, it turned out to be fine. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, Japan. When we first started going to Japan, we discovered they have all these books of um, celebrities, and um, but it's like you know, Jodie Foster, and you know, just like and they're just pictures, and they're mm-hmm. pretty great. Um, and I had a, I remember I had this Blondie book, it's just a visual book. I forget who did it, but it was sort of great seeing um, Debbie Harry with all her sort of outfits, kind of sweaty and just kind of, you know, they weren't perfect. Like everyone now looks so perfect as performers, um, mm-hmm. you know, at a certain level in the, in the business. When it's a business, you know, and not like punk rock or indie, I guess. Sure. Um, and anyway, so that, that always kind of, uh, stuck with me. Mm-hmm. That, that, that you had is this kind of like a, 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 an intent behind it would be to kind of show things as they actually were and not kind of. Yeah. And, you know, kind of, or it just sort of gave me, um, a bridge to, be able to go back and look at pictures that I would have thought were horrible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, oh, it's not so bad. Or, yeah, that outfit works. <laughs> kind of, uh, um. Well, I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful book. It has your, your, a lot of photos through the years, has a lot of your art in it. And, uh, yeah, it's really, it's really an impressive book. And the idea of icons, you kind of de, de, disempowering that concept. Uh, it's like, well, who, who for you are the first people that represented icons to you? Huh? Um, well, I guess it was kind of, um, you know, a mixture of, um, you know, like the Rolling Stones, um, the Beatles, people like that. And then, Marian Faithful or Anita Pallenberg and, um, mm-hmm. um, yeah, but also people like, um, you know, Billie Holiday because I, my dad had her records. He had a lot of jazz records. So I listened to, I really liked her records and she was so mysterious. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and tragic. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, do you feel that, uh, that sense of, of, uh, mystery and kind of unknow, unknowable sense that famous people, icons had for you that it was something gets lost the way with, with, uh, the current social media and accessibility? Um, maybe. Um, maybe I don't have any more icons. <laughs> okay. But I mean, you now are in, you, you are the one who, even though it's called no icon, mm-hmm. 
you 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 are there there are iconic aspects to to the body of work you have put together over the last yeah uh, many years and you I guess so. The weird iconicness, that's all I can say. Mm. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, I kind of, I mean, a certain. I lost you there for a second. Um, you know, it's like. Oh, I can't hear you. Oh, did no. you lose me? I did. I lost you for a second. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can. I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, no, I don't know. It's, you know, it's just, um, I don't really. You know, I kind of mostly feel good when I'm just doing something in the moment. So mm-hmm. um, it's kind of hard to relate to sure. the past in the certain way. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, what, what has it been like to to realize your sense of power in regard to your means of you trying to express yourself and and the audience's reaction to that? Like over the years, because you go from being a fan, you go from being an admirer, and suddenly you're the one that people are looking at. Yeah. I mean, is there, do you feel, was there a certain kind of thrill from that? That, or is there kind of like a, 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 a fear with it? Like, what are the feelings that came well, out? Well, maybe, realizing? you know, like, um, yeah, it's just, um, an asshole. <laughs> sort of like. Let me just make sure. Are we, Kim, do you just want to call in? Um, sure. Maybe we'll do that because the connection's getting a little, uh, a little wonky and you're cutting out. Okay. Can we, um. Send me the number? I'll send you the number. I'll, I'm going to send it to you right now. Hey, where am I at here? Am I on? You are on. Okay. Do we have Kim on the hotline? We sure do. Going to Kim right now. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hey, sorry about that. The way that the world works now is that Zoom is not always our friend. Yeah, it could be my internet. Oh, uh, this is much better. So, um, yeah. So I guess I was asking you about. Uh, I was asking about being somebody who does the shaping of things and. Uh, like the like being on the other side of it after you kind of grow up looking at these larger than life people and then suddenly somebody's looking at you that way. Um, yeah, that, that makes me really uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I think that uh, there are, um, you know, it opens up opportunities and, um, but, you know, generally, um, the best is, not to be self-conscious. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't really understand. I don't, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to think of it really. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, it's because I guess you're, you, you're not, you are it. You're not observing it. You have to also be yourself while that's happening too. So that's its own, that's its own yeah, reality. Lately that I realized maybe people, um, smile at me because they recognize me not as a person, but as a performer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, so you, there was a, there must've been a certain amount of like all of that stuff is well and good or, or you have whatever you need to sort through with it. But then when you have to go get back to work and actually go make the next thing, what like what is that's is that like an unlearning process? What is that like? Um well I kind of you know, yeah, I like to sort of forget what I did and um or just um I mean when I made the record I kind of felt like I really trusted the producer. Um that no matter what I came in with, you would make it sound like a song. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of an interesting experiment. And that's really how I looked at it. Because um, I'd never worked with a producer that way. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so you I, were, you were almost like an, you were an element of the, of the process. 
Um, well, not exactly, but I brought elements, and then he brought elements, and um, in sh- in shaping it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so yeah, it was just kind of. Um, but I felt like I did have some um, confidence in my influences in the past, like, like, you know, he works, he was, you know, people who make hip hop records or pop records and stuff. But, but he's, you know, he's, he was a fan and I realized that things that I made me want to start playing music, like no way in New York, you know, those early dissonant bands and, uh, like DNA and Mars and, um, um, you know, Arno Lindsay, mm-hmm. uh, it kind of, that music still sounds really modern to me. And so I felt like those are elements that I could, that were just in me, you know, that I could use. And, uh, that somehow, I mean, I really didn't know how the record would, would be taken because I don't, sure. you know, the music, I don't really know what the, what the music mm-hmm. scene is. It so, is, it is. It is kind of interesting because that music, like the no wave stuff, never really got, like it didn't, it did, it, it didn't have a chance to kind of get perverted or kind of run into the ground because that, that was kind of, it was a relatively small movement and it kind of was over before it started in a lot of ways. Right, right. So it's funny that that stuff is, it seems slightly like untethered from, uh, from a time and a place. If you just listen to the music, it's not just like, it's, it's got a weird, a weird kind of timelessness to it. Cause yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's not, it's not jazz. It's not rock music. It's not, um, yeah, it really is kind of its own thing. Um, what what was the first of those shows that you remember seeing where your mind was blown? Uh, well, I went to see um, Suicide, and that was that was really mind blowing. You know, just seeing Alan Vega go out into the audience and come up to you, and and, and what it was a very small um, loft club uh, or performance space. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, that was just kind of mind blowing and it was so like minimal and simplistic, um, not simplistic, but you know, minimal and, uh, but so explosive. Sure. Sure. And did you, could, cause it feels like what the, they were doing, like, like punk was this new quote unquote new thing that came through, but it seemed like there were already rules in place for so much stuff right off the bat. Yeah, it was basically like three chords rock, mm-hmm. like three chord rock, a lot of it. Yeah, so to be a part of the 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 new revolution, to, to like spook the people who thought they were spooking people, is is kind of an accomplishment. Yeah, I think um, it, and I guess when I say three chord rock, I, I'm not talking about the bands at CBGB, it's like television. Um, mm-hmm. I, I was thinking more about. LA or England or something. But, um, yeah, but it's, it's funny because they did coexist alongside that CBGB seat of television and Richard Hell. And, and a lot of them were artists who came to New York to do art. And, mm-hmm. um, um, because you, you came but, to uh, music, you, you were not, um, you were, an, you were interested in art first and saw yourself right. as an artist first. Yeah, that's why I came to New York, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it would have just seemed um, something for me, it was kind of an escape from the art world, <laughs> which was in the 80s was becoming um, really, there was a lot of money. Suddenly, like, people were buying art and it was, it, was, it became, it really changed. Um, the art scene really changed in New York in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And being like the idea of doing music was was the, that there was like an immediacy to it, or a, or a, or just an accessibility to it. What was the appeal for you to to start uh, going in that direction? I kind of could get out of my head, um, you know, with art or anything that you know a lot about. 
um, you, you, you're more self-conscious about it and it's easy to overthink it and it's just sort of such a head trip and whereas you know I didn't have any training in music so um, aside from um, improvising in the living room with my brother <laughs> banging on drums and a piano or something um, so yeah it was kind of a in a way just I liked it because it was physical and visceral and um, I had also done dance as like a teenager, Martha Graham. And I don't know, something about it. I liked the physicality of it, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But, it, but it was more than that. It was just sort of getting out of my head and um, kind of being excited about something that was, uh, I, I think I just equated it with also being new to New York and, you know, what what was a strange music? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you're you're now going into some uncharted territory. But do you, did you always feel the the voices or the presence of the the like the rock stuff that even if you knew you were like that was that's in you it's on some level because you were a, a kid growing up and and kind yeah. of into those bands yeah. even though you're going into new places did you still feel like that? Like the moves, like these are the moves and these are the, like that's the kind of, like the game of rock music. Um, it took me a long time to feel comfortable with that, actually. Um, but, uh, like now I really feel it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it took a really long time. Uh, so you, you finally got there <laughs> yeah. to where now, yeah. The thing about not, not wanting to be overly stylized you know, mm-hmm. um, or predictable on stage and that kind of like, um, you know, like it's easy to put your arms up in the air, I don't know, <laughs> pretend mm-hmm. you're like a rock hard God or something. But, uh, you know, some people do that really well. Um, and it's a powerful feeling. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a different kind of energy from like you, like you said, you're, you're always in your head, always in your head. And then there's a thing where it's like, this is as, this is like pure in the moment, uh, stuff when you're on stage. Yeah. And, suddenly like, uh, if it's the sound is good, you, you suddenly feel like your body is your head in a way. You know, you're, you kind of feel the audience. Um, are there are there ever on the other side of it? Are there other uh, are there moments when you're just like thinking about like what you want to eat after the show and <laughs> like where you're just when you're not in it? What is that like? Um, yeah, I mean, like being on tour or something, and um, I remember yeah with Sonic Youth and just kind of, um, I don't know, a very long feedback ending or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if this, you know, the sound not being good or just having a really shitty gig um, and just thinking about that book that you're going to read when you get your uh-huh. book on the bus. <laughs> sure, but it's so funny that you're up there and somebody's like breathlessly watching Kim Gordon do her thing and then you're – just wondering about whether the uh, the hotel is uh, the kitchen is still going to be open at the hotel afterwards. Yeah, it's it definitely brings it down to the mm. <laughs> um, Yeah. So how has the because you're you're you've you've got multiple books out now, and it seems like music comes and goes for you as what's on the front burner. And like, what 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 makes music keep going back to the front burner for you? I don't know. Like, I keep thinking I'm going to concentrate on art now, and um, which I have been doing pretty much. But um, like, I kind of accidentally made a song last week with Jay Mascus and Fred Harmison plays bass on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was for um, this. It's a benefit for children's hospital that sub pop does every year and i think they're airing it this saturday on 
um, YouTube something. Okay. But it, it, it's, it's kind of um, uh, Megan, who runs Sub Pop, asked us if we would do something for it. And we, they, she put the three of us together because we've been on Fred's his one of his skits with Ian Rubbish, his last as we mm-hmm. went about in his last SNL. And uh but Fred was immediately like, No way, you know, can I redo that or something? And anyway, so we you know, we spent an hour on Zoom trying to figure out how to do this and I thought I just said, Jay, just write, you know, write a riff, play the drums and uh and he did. He wrote this really cool it sounds like a really cool Dennis Jr. song <laughs> that I got to sing on. And uh, at first, I just didn't know how I was going to do it. And uh, it ended up actually coming out surprisingly good, I have to say. And um, that'll that'll be – that's something people can find later this week? Yeah, I think Saturday it's airing. I, I, I don't know what the site is or – it's it's on YouTube. Maybe if you go to Sub Pop, it will tell you about. Sure. It. Well, if I we'll track it down, we'll we'll link it from the show, uh, cool. social media and stuff. So, there's a cast of characters, mm-hmm. musicians. So with speaking of Dinosaur Junior, it's still the I'd say still loudest band I've ever seen has to be Dinosaur Junior. I think and, uh, the loudest band I ever saw was. My Bloody Valentine. Because I hmm. feel like they, there's no, re- I don't know, I just feel like they wanted to be louder than Dinosaur Jr. <laughs> but it, to me, that like I saw My Bloody Valentine also, and they were also very loud. And it was, um, but it just seemed like a, I don't know, for some reason it did not make my head vibrate the way Dinosaur Jr. Yeah. Yeah, no, I um, I had to uh, sing on stage with with them, and uh, yeah, it was so loud. You know, we, when they had those that week of shows, I forget what anniversary it was, and um, it was I was afraid <laughs> to, to be on stage with them, but it actually it was fine. Yeah, those bands when. Uh damage so yeah i don't know sometimes i still feel i'm like what what and i'm just like uh oh that was the dinosaur jr show coming back to <laughs> i'm paying the price now for a seeing dinosaur jr at the wherever back then um yeah. so so all of the you you do you work in so many media different mediums media is there is there a, an arena that you still want to try anything you, you feel like you could, you, you'd be interested to see how it would go if you, uh, well, I really, um, I'm writing a screenplay with a friend and, um, you know, this sounds like cliche. Yeah. I live in LA. I'm writing a screenplay, uh-huh. <laughs> but, um, no, I, I would like to be involved with making a film. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully that will happen. I mean, I've made films, like I made an art film, actually, uh, for this biennial in South Korea, in Busan, that opens like a month ago or something. Um, but I really love film so much. Um, yeah, you, uh, you, um, you've acted in films. Right, you were in the uh, Gus Van Sant movie. The, yeah, a couple of them. You were in. Uh, do you like? So you like? You want to now? What do you want? Do you want? Do you want to be a writer? Do you want to direct the? What, what's the? I just kind of maybe want to like. I'm you know helping write it and um, you know just um, be involved with as a producer, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. Well, that's a look. That would be. Uh... I mean, the directoring is so you know. Um, I really admire. I mean, um, oh my god! So the last time I saw you was at Kelly Records screening of a film. That's right. 
for that was that was literally as I think coronavirus was on a boat uh hovering in the Los Angeles uh harbor waiting to shut us down. It was like that was like days before everything got shut down. Just yeah. waiting to shut the city down. Uh yeah. but it was uh yeah, that was for first cow. That was such a great movie. Yeah, so good. Yeah, I felt bad for Kelly because she, uh, well, she probably didn't care about ha- having her her PR trip canceled, but uh, for the rollout of her movie because it's such a beautiful movie to see on a big screen. Yeah, that's the that's the part that I I felt bad for her also that people didn't get to see it in the theater. But I'm glad it's out now and people have all seen it and everybody loves it. It's uh, yeah. I don't know. There's something so the way she works, it's like every single moment is so deliberate and paced that I almost, I can't stand it sometimes. (laughs) Yeah. Like there's not like a, there's not a false moment in anything she does. Yeah. And the details are so important. Yeah, and it's the kind of thing where if it was like, if somebody told you it's like, well, there's a movie about uh, two dudes who start stealing milk from a cow, you'd be like, okay, I don't know about that movie. And then it's just like, then you see it, you're like, oh, my God, she she can take that and turn it into first cow. That's, uh, she's, uh, to me, she's at the just at the highest level you could be at, Kelly Record. Yeah, she really is. So on the other side of things, what's like, what's some like junky stuff you watch when you're just sitting around? Oh, um, well, I mean, I watched The Crown. I mean, that's kind of well made, I suppose. Um, well, that's like, that's like well made entertainment that's maybe, that's that's well made. Um, uh, well, when, um, my good friend comes over. Sometimes we watch Sex in the City. <laughs> okay. Like, yeah. year, just, like just campier and camp, you know, more and more ridiculous. Um, just looking back at, you know, what they were wearing and it was always campy, but you know, now it's like insane. So that, that's probably like, I guess the trashiest thing I watch. Yeah. And it's funny when you watch that show and you're just like, she seems so, like shocked by everything and it's like aren't you a sex columnist like how how are you like so thrown by these conversations when it's her and the other three talking and she seems just like truly flustered yeah it's like so you watch you seen it well, sorry you so you've watched the show oh I, yeah i've seen every episode of sex in the city oh, okay sure I wonder, like, how men see it, or like, you know, it's just, just, you know, I mean, it, it's ridiculous, of course, but I think, I think, even though it's it's for women, I think everybody, I think men alike, also kind of project themselves to figure out which of the four they are more like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think everybody. How could you not? do that because they cover the four it's like they are like the four horsemen of the apocalypse or something i don't know they're like the four seasons is what they uh, that's what i meant to say they are like <laughs> it so yeah i guess i would end up being kind of like kind of like the golden girls in a way yeah i guess yeah it is like that kind of like and so as far as sex in the city goes i guess i would be Miranda, I guess. Yeah, I guess I would be Miranda too. <laughs> Maybe everybody thinks they're like a Miranda, like responsible and and just reliable and, and on point work wise. And maybe we're not. Maybe that's like a trap. It's like a psychological test. If you think you're a Miranda, you're not. Maybe. Are you repressed your other sides? Yeah. I don't know. I be maybe if you're a little too gung ho to say which one you are, you're not that one. <laughs> like if somebody's like, "Oh, I'm a Samantha," it's like, well, "Are you?" Let's. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the men in the show are all kind of horrible. I mean, as sure. kind of women are. 
They're the worst. No. The worst. It's, a, it, it's really a bad portrayal of humanity. It's <laughs> Mr. Big is awful. Mr. Adrian. Best of them, though, I have to say. Adrian, I just couldn't deal with at all. Now, Adrian, who's a who? It's a, who's your favorite? I, I look. I like Steve. I have a soft spot for Steve. Uh, I'd best just say Big, even though he's also ridiculous. But he's and just so horrible. horrible man. Yeah, no, he to me is like the worst. He's the worst of New York, Mister Big. Like that's like. Like that kind of guy in New York is what makes people not like New York City. Yeah, I feel like that show actually ruined New York City. <laughs> quite frankly, well, well, it sold it sold a very unattainable version of living in New York City to people. Like it's not it's I, I it, how many people must have like young women moved to New York thinking like. They want some of that, and it's like, well, that isn't <laughs> isn't real life. There's none of that here. Yeah, yeah, and you can't, you know, you can't afford an apartment and buy those shoes. No, you can't. Exactly that, and uh, it's just that, yeah, like you're not going to be working as a as like a uh, columnist, yeah. and so yeah, so Sex in the City. That is the, well, that look, I, I've logged plenty of miles on sex in the city. What were the things that made when you, cause you grew up in California, what were the, th- what were the images you had of New York? Like the, whatever would have been misconceptions or, or fantasies about what was there before you got there? Hmm. Well, I, um, you know, when I was little, I had those books, the little, the lonely doll. Have you ever seen those books? No. They're kind of creepy, but um, it definitely, I carried those images with me, and it was sort of of the Upper East Side in Central Park around there, and this doll, and there are photographs in this book that tell the story, and it's this doll, and she meets this little bear, and the little bear brings her home, and the Papa Bear. They're living in this like Upper East Side apartment, and the the lonely doll, uh, the doll. When the Father Bear goes away, she gets into the jewelry of this of the house. The woman you never see anyone else, but mm-hmm. puts all this jewelry on, and the Papa Bear comes home, and he gets she gets in trouble, and he kind of says, "We're going to send you away if you do that again," or something. <laughs> But anyway, there's somehow these images, they're very existential looking, these photographs, and specifically like in her dress is this kind of pink checked kind of dress with a little pinafore or something. Anyway, somehow that that was my first image of New York. Okay, Uh uh-huh. And, you know, just movies, I guess, Um, you know, uh, just seeing so many movies that, you know, like you just had, yeah, you have this, you have this image of what it's going to feel like. And then, I mean, it really does. No other place feels like, uh, like New York until you're there to actually see. It's like, Oh, this is what the, like the, like the, the temperature of the place is actually like to walk around. Yeah. And actually when I moved to New York, it all felt very familiar and, um, it reminded me of Hong Kong where I lived when I was 12 for a year and because it was so dense and crowded and noisy and sweaty and hot and humid in the summer. Um, mm. so I kind of walking through Chinatown, I, I felt like, Oh, okay, this is, I loved it. Like it just felt, even though I hated <laughs> as a 12 year old, I hated living in Hong Kong, but mm-hmm. I, I, it just kind of hit something of, you know, this very familiar. Yeah, good. You, you had a, there was a phrase you used in, uh, girl in a band, which I always remember where it was something to the effect that New York is so chaotic and there's so much energy and stuff that it almost unburdens you of your neuroses to a degree. 
Yeah, like in L.A., because there's no center of gravity and everything just feels like it's floating outwards, it kind of always made me, when I'm growing up, feeling restless or like I needed to be doing something. Mm -hmm. Not that I still feel like that. But when I moved to New York, I just felt like there's so much activity going on around me that it was almost soothing. I don't know how to explain that. It's like... Um, no, it's 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 a real thing, and it, it it's very it what? makes it makes perfect sense when you think about the movements that that come from New York. It's just like, I mean, so look, I always think about when like the Velvet Underground came west and just ate it. No one wanted that when they brought their their East Coast business to Los Angeles. And it's just, it is its own thing. And yeah. it doesn't necessarily translate. Do you miss the East Coast? Uh, I, I would say I miss, uh, pierogies. Uh, I miss pierogies a bunch. But I like, I like Los Angeles. I like being here. Yeah. You've been out here for a while. How long have we been here? For about a year. Okay. I miss. I miss. Uh, uh, I'm not going to say like pizza and bagels because everybody's so demented with mm-hmm. when they start talking about their pizza talk. That's <laughs> always like. It always makes me want to just be a contrarian and just go like, I like Los Angeles pizza. What? <laughs> they, they, like their heads explode. If, <laughs> <laughs> they cannot handle it. What do you remember? Who? I and mean, I'm not trying to just keep going down memories lane, memory lane with things, but it's just like, who are some of the who are some of the people? Because like you grow up in Los Angeles, and there's like mm-hmm. a certain relationship to famous people and stuff. And who? Well, who are some of those people to you where you're where you were just like, oh my god, it's that person, and you're sharing. An or you're in the orbit of that person or sharing a space with that person. Mm. Well, I didn't really have any encounters like that growing up, but I, I did know Bruce Berry. Um, sure. When I lived in Venice, um, our landlord was this Argentinian guy. They lived next door and he was um, a roadie for, Dave Crosby, Sills, and Nash, and Young, I guess. And um, mm-hmm. he and Bruce Berry were both roadies. And so they would, you know, they would come back from tour, and we would sort of go carousing around. And one night, like, Bruce Berry, but I didn't put it together. That he's Tonight's the Night. The song Tonight's the Night, Neil yeah. Young song, is about... Bruce. with Neil and I was like oh my god that song is about Bruce Berry and um and he had overdosed at a point yeah he had overdosed and uh but one night um like we went as we ended up at um four in the morning or no it was like sunrise like at, on the top of some mountain up Moho and at his what he said his brother's house which is jan barry from jan and dean yes Uh, okay and but there was all these rumors like well actually bruce was his illegitimate son but there's basically jan was sleeping or something and it was kind of sunrise and this woman was walking around topless with like a fringe vest where playing the fiddle (laughs) um so that that's my brush with uh so that was the first one Bruce like the uh, got, uh, somebody who was connected to Crosby Stills and Nash and then CSNY and then just years later you fit you piece it together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, now that's uh it's always amazing when you realize that people are just people also with those yeah. those moments. Because, uh, like, like, how about from a career? You've, you've done so many collaborations over the years. Well, what is that process like for you to just 
see a person as the person, not the, mm. not the image. Like when you, when it's time to actually get down to work, cause you've, you've done so many things with so many uh-huh. iconic people over the years. What's that process? I mean, the weirdest one was, um, well, we were supposed to do a song with Cypress Hill and this, I don't know if you remember that this period in music history when people thought it was a great idea to put rock and rap together. Sure, the Judgment Night soundtrack was a exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm, where they and, were. Um, so I think we sort of decided that after all going there once to the studio, that me and Thurston would just go in and do something. And anyway, there were many hours listening to just a kick drum <laughs> and uh-huh. love ganja being smoked. Um, and I don't know. It was kind of, you know, we didn't want to do a bad, we don't want to, we didn't want to be the ones to make a bad Cypress Hill record. So we kind of, and we didn't want to do what was sort of expected for us to just put noise guitar on it. So, um, but it was uh, funny because I can't remember his name, but you know the guy who does insane in the membrane. You know, um, be real. What's his name? Yes, mm-hmm. that'd be real. But the the other other okay. guy. Okay, all right. Um, he kept saying, "Be real." Kept saying, "Hey man, come up with something." <laughs> anyway, mm-hmm. After he laid down his thing, and and then I went in and this I had an idea for something. And, he whispered in my ear and I went out and I did something. And so when I did the, the hooky thing, but he was getting, B real was getting mad at, um, God, I wish I could remember his name. Something doc. Let's see. I don't know, whatever. Sure. Um, but it, it was just, uh, that was, I know it's, it's weird to collaborate with people who you don't know. You know, it's not really like a real collaboration. So, um, like, I feel like what Bill and I do with Body Head and our improv duo, that's, that's a real collaboration. And, um, but we play together so much where, you know, we think of ourselves as a band, actually. Sure. Um, and, and that, I, that first album, I just have to say that, that first record, especially just people, if people missed it, that's, that's like, that's a high watermark in your, uh, career. Oh, thanks. That first record is such a, <laughs> amazing raw thing. I just, I was always blown away by that record. Oh, cool. Thank you. No, I mean, that stuff, that really means a lot to me. That, is, um, that collaboration and, you know, it's still ongoing. Um, actually we're supposedly doing a record with, uh, uh, for three love for their anniversary. You know, that label, right? Which label? Sorry. Three Love Records. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, no, there. That's a that's a great label because you mentioned the uh, the Gun uh, Trzyski record. Then they they put a record out. I think they put a Neil Haggerty record. They put so many things out. They put Kurt Kurt Vile records out. Our friend Kurt Vile. They put something out. He did with uh, collaborations. Like one person will be on one side and one person on another side or one band. And um, sure. so they're having some anniversary. So he asked me and Bill to do a record. And then we asked Aaron Dillaway, um, do you know him? He's like, I don't. kind of part, he, he's from Wolf Eyes. He's sort of part of like, he also does solo stuff. He's part of this sort of Detroit heavy, although he lives in Ohio, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, kind of noise scene there, um, mm-hmm. experimental scene. But so we sent him, uh, we basically, because of COVID, we couldn't really figure out how to record <laughs> um, together. So we still remembered we had these tracks we'd started when we did our last Body Head record that we kind of rejected or we just kind of put away and then started over like six months later. He sent those to Aaron, um, and then we also sent kind of individually some more vocal and guitar parts to just – do something with to kind of just mix and fuck with. And Mm -hmm. so, um, very curious (laughs) what he came up with. Um, 
And Kurt, we both have Kurt in common as one of our good oh, yeah, yeah, friends. He's the best. Kurt, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, liked, I really liked his last record a lot. Oh, my God, yeah. Did you hear the new EP that he just put out? No, I didn't. It's good. There's a there's a couple of John Prine songs on it. It's really and there's a duet. It's really beautiful. He's uh Yeah. Now Kurt, one of the most exciting things is getting to watch Kurt go down the road he's going down. Yeah. It's uh he uh, matured in a way. I didn't think he I didn't know he would. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you never know where somebody's going to go, but he, Kurt's a, Kurt's a lifer and he's, he's, uh, it's just exciting to watch him try stuff and, uh, yeah. And he's such a good dude also. Yeah, honestly. I mean, uh, what he gets away with, you know, mm-hmm. with his lyrics, it's, it's pretty he, interesting. He's really funny and he's really, uh, He's really honest it, when you when you just look past the humor or the playfulness. There's so much there. He's really he's uh, I love him. I'm so glad. It's nice when you're friends with a really talented person. Like, yeah, talented. yeah. Well, Kim, I'm not going to keep you any longer. This was such a treat to talk to you and. uh yeah, I didn't. I didn't know what to expect because last time I was on your show, <laughs> <laughs> you had Gary the Squirrel and Gene Simmons yelling at you. That's right. <laughs> it's a little different this time. Uh, yeah. Surprise! <laughs> yeah. Well, the and, and the new book is no icon, and it's really beautiful. And uh, I'm so glad you put this together because it really is just a testament to a career and a life and uh just as a fan it's exciting to see all of this in one place so every- oh, thanks so much tom that's so sweet of you yeah and your memoir yeah coming soon all right all right well thank you so much kim we'll, we'll talk to you soon. i hope to run into you somewhere you well, let's get past the coronavirus and then i will see you face to face okay all right you take care oh.